And now, it's time to sit back and enjoy the Two True Freaks Internet Radio Broadcast. Attention, people, Earth. Do not resist us. All who oppose us shall be annihilated. We command the most powerful army of monsters in the universe. They are sure to defeat your Earth monsters. All those who are hearing this are now under the control of the Earth Destruction Directive. Hello everyone and welcome to Earth Destruction Directive. I am your host as always, Mr. Luke Giaconetti. would like to thank everyone for downloading and listening to the show. Hope everyone enjoyed our previous episode where we took a look at episodes 30 and 31 of the original Ultraman series featuring the monsters Wu and Coronia. We're going to be changing tact a little bit here today. Uh, we're not doing a live action uh, feature. We're actually taking a look at the third of the Netflix Godzilla animes, The Planet Eater. So very excited to finish up that series and see how that story ends. But before we get into that, we have got some news, so let's jump right into it. Godzilla x Mechagodzilla is getting a limited theatrical engagement in the United States on Thursday, November 3rd, which is, of course, Godzilla Day. GXMG, as it's often called in the fandom, at least uh, it was back when it came out, uh, also known here in the West as Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, covered way back in episode 49 of Earth Destruction Directive. It's actually never been released theatrically in the U.S., uh, so this is a real treat to see the uh, the fan favorite from 2002 on the big screen. Now, you can check FathomEvents.com to see if there's a theater in your area that is showing the film. Now, I'm a big fan of Fathom Events, especially Rift Tracks Live, which I've been to several of, including Mothra, which we covered here on the show, and, of course, uh, Shin Godzilla, which was covered here on the show as well. Uh, if you like going to the movies, then these special engagements, I think they're really fun. You know, there's always something special to me about going to the movies growing up as I did in the 80s and 90s, so it's nice to see these uh, these limited engagements. Uh, not sure if I can make it Thursday. Sometimes can be a little tough for me with my personal schedule, uh, but if you go, please let me know. I'd love to hear about it. In other news, in honor of the 50th anniversary whoo, of Godzilla vs. Gigan, next month we'll be seeing a short film entitled Godzilla vs. Gigan Rex. Now, this will be a fully CGI animated effort, and the description, translated from Japanese, goes, A horde of Gigan that appeared in the previous work attacked the Earth again. In addition, a red Gigan called Gigan Rex will also appear, appear. Will Godzilla be able to repel Gigan Rex, who boasts outstanding fighting ability? Uh, the trailer shows off multiple Gigans and the red Gigan Rex, along with a very ferocious-looking Godzilla. Now, the short's being produced by the outfit Gemstone, which is partially operated by Toho. Uh, now, Gemstone was also responsible for a short film in 2019 called G vs. G, which was also a CGI effort with Godzilla battling multiple Gigans. So this looks like it's a sequel to that, which is what they're saying when they say the horde of Gigan that appeared in the previous work. Uh, Godzilla vs. Gigan Rex slated to be released uh, at the festival, on uh, November 3rd, so likely it'll show up on YouTube as well. Previous festival shorts have shown up uh, on, on YouTube, so stay tuned for that. Now, also on November 3rd, November 3rd's a big day if you're a Godzilla fan. Uh, Toho has really leaned into that marketing over the last few years. Uh, Fest Godzilla 3, Gigan's Attack, which is a live action short feature from the same team who did last year's Godzilla vs. Hedra short, also set to be released at the festival. Now, this uh, short is actually using a crowdfunded replica of the Showa Gigant suit, which is really cool, and he'll be battling the same Final Wars Godzilla suit from that Hedra short, so this should look really neat. The teaser is up on YouTube. In fact, as I'm recording, it just went up on YouTube. Looks like a lot of fun. I've been a fan of Gigant since I was a little kid, so more Gigant is always welcome. Again, I am going to be assuming that this will be on YouTube, on or around November 3rd, because that's when the festival is, so stay tuned for that one. Definitely be checking both of those out. And finally, in toy news, we've got two of my favorite things literally coming together here as the Hot Wheels Godzilla character car and monster truck 
are coming out very soon. Now, uh, in uh, November, very early November, as a Target exclusive, we will be getting the Godzilla character car, which is based on the Hino Heavy Construction Truck, which is a big six-wheeled construction truck. Uh, now, the load in the bed resembles Godzilla's spines. The tow hook is inspired by his tail, and the hood and front bumper and tire guards over the front wheels looks like Godzilla's snout, jaw, and claws. Uh, now, stamped on the side is like an operating number, like you might see in a commercial vehicle. The operating number is 110354, referencing, of course, the release date of Gojira all those many years ago. With a, uh, the same uh, body style will be released as a monster truck, uh, it's sometime in early 2023. Uh, hat tip to John Vanover, who posted this on my Facebook. And uh, wow, okay, like I said, I love Godzilla and I love Hot Wheels. I, I have a Godzilla and Mothra set of diecast cars that I think they're Toma Cub, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but I've never, never thought I would see a Hot Wheels one. Hot Wheels is my favorite diecast car. I've collected a lot of Hot Wheels over the years, folks. Uh, I have toyed with doing a Hot Wheels podcast. I'm not sure how that would work. It need to be more of a YouTube, but either way, um, definitely going to be on the lookout for this. It looks really cool. The monster truck looks really cool too. Uh, but, um, yeah, for, I mean, and I can totally justify, you know, four bucks on a, on a Hot Wheels character car. I would have liked if it was metal on metal and Real Rider, but you don't always see that with the character cars, and I've never seen Real Rider, which are the real rubber tires, on a six-wheeled vehicle, and I've never seen them with the Nobby kind of off-road, so I don't know if that was possible, but it does look very cool. Um, you can check this out. It's, I saw it on Action Figure Insider is where John linked me to, so go check it out. If you like die-cast cars and Godzilla, this seems like a no-brainer to me. All right, uh, that's all I've got. If you've got any news, please go ahead and send it in to Earth Destruction Directive at yahoo.com. Uh, I will be sure to give you a shout-out here on the show, and... Um, well, we'll talk about anything that comes up, you know, there's all, all sorts of news. Like I said, November seems to be a big time because of Godzilla Day, so we get a lot of stuff. So, uh, okay, so that's all I've got. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about Godzilla the Planet Eater right here on Earth Destruction Directive. What do you get when a fantasy gaming horror sci-fi geek and an army veteran history nerd want to do a comic book related podcast? Why? You get the Weird Wars podcast, of course. Weird War Tales was a 124 issue DC comic book series published from 1971 to 1983. Along the way, we'll sidetrack on to an occasional special mission where we discuss an issue of a like themed comic book from a different title or publisher. There are also the rare Road Warriors episodes where we report on comic related road trips like conventions or visiting the homes and grave sites of comic greats. We'll nitpick what the comics creative team got wrong and crawl about what they got right. We'll also break down the facts behind the fiction in the stories, which is sometimes quite weird in its own right. Even the letters page and our favorite ads can't escape our judgment just as we can't escape yours in our own dead letter office mailbag. Torpedo eating dinosaurs. Haunted chateaus. Time traveling rats. Zombie robots. Day walking vampires. Gargoyle armies. And that's just in the first 20 Weird War Tales episodes. So report for duty with the Weird Warriors podcast with Max and Rich, where we promise to make war no more. All right, we are back here on Earth Destruction Directive. Godzilla, the planet eater, released in Japan as Gojira Hoshi Okumono. Literally, Godzilla, the one who harvests the stars, was produced by Toho Animation and animated by Polygon Pictures, and is the third entry in a trilogy of animated Godzilla films. The film was released to Japanese theaters on November 9th, 2018, then became available to stream worldwide via Netflix on January 9th, 2019. Our writer is Gen Urobochi. Now, in addition to the writing credits on the two previous Godzilla anime, which we uh, have covered on this show, uh, Urobochi has numerous Japanese science fiction writing credits. Uh, the ones that stood out to me, the animes Psycho Pass and Fate Slash Zero. And this one, too, the tokusatsu Kamen Rider Gaim. Uh, shout out to Derek W. w. Crab, who's a big fan of Gaim. Uh, our directors are uh, Koban Shizuno, and Hiroyuki Sashida. Now, they co-directed all three of the Godzilla anime films, 
uh, together. Now, Shizuno, on his own, has many directorial credits on various different anime, uh, most of which, I'll be honest with you, I'm not real familiar with, but I'm not real big into the anime scene. While Sashida has credits uh, as varied as art director on Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within, all the way up to visual effects director on the film Big Man Japan. So obviously he's been doing a lot of different stuff. Our producer is Takashi Yoshizawa. Uh, he produced all three of the Godzilla anime films, as well as the producer of the subsequent uh, anime Godzilla Singular Point, which was a series rather than, than films. So our synopsis is adapted from Wikipedia and goes a little something like this. Following the destruction of Mechagodzilla City, as seen in Godzilla, City on Edge of Battle, go check out Earth Destruction Directive number 98, the remaining Bulu Saludo on the Eritrum demand justice for Haru Sakaki destroying what they saw as necessary to defeat Godzilla. The humans disagree, believing Haru explo exposed excuse me, the Bulu Saludo's true intentions of assimilating Earth. The Bulu Saludo revolt and shut down the ship's engine room, forcing the ship to run on secondary batteries for the next two days. Back on Earth, Haru learns from Dr. Martin that Yuko is rendered brain-dead with the nanometal in her body keeping her alive. He also learns that those treated by the Hoatua survive the nanometal's attempts to absorb them, with Metaphys deceiving the survivors into believing that their survival was divine intervention. When confronted by Haru about converting the remaining humans, Metaphys reveals his plan to bring the Exif's god to Earth and needs Haru's help to make it possible. Dr. Martin advises Haru to hide until tensions ease. Haru is escorted to a remote camp by the Hoatua twins, Mina and Miana. Miana explains privately to Haru that her people have no concept of hatred, and that their concept of life revolves around winning, surviving and making more life, or losing, dying and disappearing. She tells Haru that he is losing, and offers to connect life with him, eh, eh, but he turns her down. When Mena later extends the same offer, he realizes it was she who had rescued him back in the day, not her sister Miana, and accepts. Miana discovers Metaphys telepathically communicating with fellow Exif on the Eritrum in Durf, and the Exif reveals his plans before capturing her, as she telepathically contacts Haru and Mina. Metaphys later conducts a ritual with his followers in conjunction with Endurf to summon their god, Ghidorah, to defeat Godzilla. Ghidorah manifests as a shadow on Earth and partially through singularities in space, devouring Metaphys' followers and destroying the Eritrum. Ghidorah then proceeds to attack Godzilla, who is helpless against the intangible monster as its heads bite Godzilla and drain his energy. Dr. Martin concludes that Ghidorah's true form exists in another plane of existence and is being guided by someone in their universe. Haru, finding it to be Metaphys, who has replaced his right eye with the amulet he repaired with the nanometal. Metaphys proceeds to reveal that his people devoted themselves to Ghidorah since they learned that their universe is finite and fated to destruction, having offered planets for the monster to feed on. Proceeding to telepathically assault Haru, Metaphys explains that the human's hatred towards Godzilla made him an ideal offering, and tells Haru that he must submit himself to Ghidorah as its witness to enable its full manifestation. Mina and Dr. Martin used a Hoatuan god's egg to psychically reach Haru and reveal how to stop Ghidorah. Haru learning that Metaphys orchestrated the deaths of the Tau Seti E exploration party, including Haru's father, so that they could be saved. At the same time, Haru recalls the charm he lost the day he fled from Earth as a boy. Its image of flowers reminds him of the meaning of his name, Spring, and the power of hope to overcome despair. Haru then breaks free and cracks Metaphys' amulet, causing Ghidorah to become affected by Earth's physics, and as such being ultimately defeated by Godzilla. Metaphys dies telling Haru that Ghidorah will always be watching him as long as he lives. Time passes as the survivors bury their weapons and integrate into Hoatua society, with Mina pregnant with Haru's child. Dr. Martin tells Haru that he got the last remaining vulture mech working, having discovered how to use Mechagodzilla's nanometal, found in Yuko's body, as a tool to rebuild their civilization as it once was. Haru's right eye stings, hearing Metaphys' voice that this turn of events would ensure Ghidorah's eventual return to their reality. Taking Yuko's body with him, 
Haru provokes Godzilla into destroying him and all traces of the living nanometal for the good of the Hoatua. This prevents Ghidorah from returning as the Hoatua continue to live, aso- live alongside Godzilla, treating the kaiju like a natural disaster to be respected and avoided, but not warred with. Later, Mina, showing signs of advanced age, watches a group of children conduct a ritual honoring Haru, placing a knotted strings representing their fears into a fire under a wooden effigy of a vulture mech. As the final installment of a trilogy, generally, all rules are off and anything can happen. Now, given what went down at the end of the previous movie, I think it's safe to say that's the intention here as well, so let's get right into the notes. Similar to what I felt going into City on the Edge of Battle, given the cliffhanger of Planet of the Monsters, I was not really sure what to expect here after the last cliffhanger, with Yuka dead, Mechagodzilla City destroyed, and Godzilla still standing tall. Now, of course, the post credit scene of that film revealed that the Exif God was Ghidorah, so his presence seemed a given, but beyond that, I was pretty in the dark about what direction this story would take. While the first film saw humanity take a tactical approach to defeating Godzilla, and the second film demonstrated the Bilu Saludo's technological method, this film focuses on the Exif's, what I have to call a spiritual plan to defeat Godzilla, personified in Metaphys. It forms an intriguing third leg for the series, because what is left with which to fight? When your enemy resists being outmaneuvered, overcomes your advanced technology, faith in a source even more powerful than that enemy would seem to be the only recourse. The speed with which the survivors of Mechagodzilla City begin to believe Metaphys' statement about the so-called miracles all around them informs us as viewers of the desperation of humanity at this point, clinging to any potential victory and re- reclamation of Earth. Now, of course, the XF being aliens especially aliens with an X in their name, the offer is less than genuine, let's just say. The old Monster Zero gambit, if you will. Now, building on that spiritual theme, Metaphys' belief in the finite nature of the universe, meaning that ultimately nothing matters because there is only one possible outcome, creates an overwhelming feeling of nihilism. Now, from the Latin nihil, meaning nothing, nihilism is a school of philosophy which rejects generally accepted principles of existence, now, in the context of the Planet Eater, Metaphys and the Exif's belief that, since all civilizations are destined to bring about their own destruction, that no life holds any intrinsic value. This is typically referred to, specifically, as existential nihilism. Specifically, Metaphys' argument that life is nothing but suffering, for which we all pray for release, taps into a fundamental tenet of nihilism, and ultimately provides a profound oppositional viewpoint for this film. Because really... What did any of it matter? What did the sacrifices of those who died in the first battle against Godzilla, or died at Mechagodzilla City, or died on the Eritrum, or anyone else, really, mean in the grand scheme of things? I think it's safe to say that all of us, at a certain age, begin to dabble and dip our proverbial toe into the school of nihilism. Why am I here? For what possible purpose could I have been born? If I was not born, or if I died tomorrow, Would anyone even notice that I'm gone? These are powerful feelings, tapping into an all-too-common human frailties and negative emotions. Now, unfortunately, as humans, we are all quite talented at finding the fault in ourselves and grabbing a hold of it. Metaphys knows this quite well, and that's how he works his persuasion on Haru. Haven't you suffered enough? What good came from a life of nothing but pain and loss? It's a grim and harsh bit of villainy, especially if I'm being honest, coming as it is now that there's an increased awareness of mental illness and the internal conflicts with which we all struggle going on in the world. Now, naturally, the counterpart to this is Haru's eventual determination about the value of life through the lens of the coming spring after a hard winter. Of course, it's all right there in his name, you know, but for us English speakers, that's a bit more obscure. In any event, this turn about life being worth the struggle when you have hope for things to get better is similarly, I think, a very modern theme to me, as we come to be more aware of the challenges of mental illness, like I said. I especially love the demonstration of this theme in the Denouement, with the static images of the remaining Eritrum crew integrating themselves into the Hoatua. I am more prone to images like this given how I have become a romantic in my middle age. Those static images did a number on me as a viewer, though. I had assumed that these scenes would lead us right to either an epilogue or the end credits. I honestly, did not foresee the last scene coming. 
But as soon as Dr. Martin started talking about the nanometal, I had a sinking feeling in my gut, and I knew that that peaceful ending, which I felt Haru had earned, was all going to be dashed. The pivot from a happy ending to a tragic one is quite powerful. It reminded me quite a bit of the comic book series Godzilla The Half-Century War, as covered way back in episode 21, where our hero ultimately decides that the ultimate sacrifice, choosing to go out on his own terms, for the betterment of the world is the only choice they can make. Now in fiction, we can examine choices like this and analyze them, because the characters aren't really alive. So using it here, with Haru having given up his hatred of Godzilla, and living a peaceful life, with Mina pregnant even, only to have to make the ultimate choice is harsh, but it still makes us think. Could we make the same choice to sacrifice our peace and happiness for the greater good? Food for thought from our monster cartoon movie. As an aside, you know, between this and Adam, Tebow, and I talking about uh, the value of life in uh, Gamma 3 Revenge of Eris, and my brother and I talking about Katsura's choice in uh, Terror of Mechagodzilla, I've seen this theme kind of pop up a lot lately. And I don't know if it's just a specifically kind of an Asian approach or if it's just a science fiction thing, but, you know, I... I Given given our, our better understanding now of both mental health and what drives someone to, to commit suicide, I'd like to call for a moratorium on this particular story engine. Um, you know, I understand a story is a story, and as I said, these are fictional characters, but you know, may, maybe it's time to put this one in the box for a little bit and uh, come back to something else. I'm not saying I disagreed with it here. I personally would have been very happy with Haru having a happy ending. But, you know, as a viewer, you don't get to di dictate the terms of your story. You have to accept the story as it's given, and then we're allowed to criticize, right? So, <sighs> that said, of course, anything goes in part three of a trilogy, and the final fate of Haru is not the only choice made here, which supports this central tenet of fiction. The complete and utter destruction of the Eritrum is another shocker which surprised me upon viewing. The Eritrum was the engine which got this entire story started, and certainly a driving force behind the events of the previous two films. Having it be wiped out halfway through this film, it signals to the viewer that, you know, all bets are off. Once that happens, we always have to have some doubt in the back of our mind. Can Godzilla defeat Ghidorah? How do you fight something which does not play by the laws of physics? So, by setting us up, they've now, for, uh, not, not foreshadowed, but they've made that suggestion that, hey, you know, this is the last one in the series, anything can happen. Now, it may be a little unusual that I've gone on for a few minutes here in the notes. Well, not that I've gone on. I go on a lot. But that I've gone on for a few minutes without really talking about either Godzilla or Ghidorah. Because the only thing we Daikaiju fans care about is monster fights, right? Anyway, building on the last film, we once again do not get to see Godzilla Earth really do all that much. Of course, when you're as large as a mountain... You are not going to be doing cartwheels, but while the last time out I didn't feel much for him, here, having that previous film as a prologue, I found myself understanding him more as a, both a monster and a character. Pitting him against the interdimensional Ghidorah helps quite a bit with this. As Godzilla's claws swipe right through Ghidorah with no effect, we can feel a similar wave of frustration. And of course, when he finally unloads on his foe, the effect is downright cathartic. Ghidorah himself is just as unusual an interpretation of the classic space monster as Godzilla has been in this series. This pseudo-Lovecraftian take on the King of Terror was sure to rankle fans, and it did. It did, I know you're surprised. But personally, I think it works. To me, Ghidorah is gold, has three long necks ending in dragon heads, rules the skies, and comes from outer space. Sounds about right to me. Even though it's a wildly different take, I think that this Wings of Death iteration works quite well. It may seem like a bit of a weird take, but I think of this along the lines of what Mattel is doing with their Masters of the Universe property, or Archie is doing with their Riverdale crew. In both set cases, you have a series of characters with well-defined visuals being taken and adapted in different settings and situations where their looks change, but the base factors are still the same. We recognize He-Man and Skeletor, or Archie and Betty and Veronica and Jughead, because of their consistent design and personality aspects, despite different settings or tones, much like we do with Godzilla and Ghidorah. The other great example of this in this film, of course, is Mothra, though not named, 
but immediately recognizable as the great winged monster god of the so-called primitives living on Earth. I mean, if that's not Mothra, what is? Now, one of the complaints I had with City on the Edge of Battle was the pacing, and I must admit that I found that this film moved along at a much faster clip than its predecessor. It certainly does not seem to drag in the middle as much as City did. Um, I think it was, um, you know, just, just, it had a lot more forward momentum is what I felt. Similarly, I found myself a bit more interested in the characters this time out. Haru and Metaphys are still the same people who we followed for two films now, but the changes which they undergo during this film I found very interesting. Haru letting go of his hate and learning instead to have hope gives him a sort of redemption arc, allowing him to grow. Before all of that is taken away from him in the end, but there you go. Metaphys, on the other hand, he does not change per se, but instead I think our perception of him changes. He was always manipulative, always secretive, but with the full extent of these traits revealed, he moves into a more ambiguous place. He's the villain, no question, but at the end of the day, Haru still cares for him as a friend or mentor, making for a complex relationship. I thought the image of Haru crying over Metaphys' body to be very powerful, and you know that not everything is black and white. Similarly, Mina comes a lot more into her own in this film. Her belief about winning and losing in life, and the importance of sanctity of life, prevents a much more humanistic attitude than any other character in this series. It is telling that she is the last character standing. At the very end, in the epilogue, we have no idea what has happened to any of the other survivors except for her. So maybe there's something to her philosophy after all. Of course, speaking of Mina, I would be remiss if I did not mention the love scene with Mina and Haru. Tasteful, subtle, but still a first for the series, and if I'm being honest, a scenario unlikely to be repeated. Just saying. Now, overall, I found Godzilla the Planet Eater to be a fitting finale to the trilogy. These anime are unlike anything else in the Godzilla series, taking full advantage of the medium to tell their stories. Now, this specific film uses that format well, showing us a battle between Godzilla and Ghidorah unlike any that we have ever seen in the series, and would be pretty much impossible to pull off in, in a live-action setting. The philosophical battle between our two main humanoid characters is compelling and thought-provoking. Now, I will grant you that this film and its cohorts is not for everyone. This is most definitely a human-based sci-fi drama, which includes monsters rather than what we might call a monster movie. And, you know, not unlike a lot of third films in the series, you really have to have watched the other two for this one to make any sense. But if you go into the film with an open mind, I think you could find quite a lot to enjoy, even if it's not necessarily what you might expect from the term Godzilla anime. Now, if you want to own Godzilla the Planet Eater, unfortunately, here in the U.S., you do not have a whole lot of options. It's not been released on home media. The film, along with its two predecessors, is still only available for streaming on Netflix. Uh, now, there are Japanese DVD and Blu-ray releases. Um, unfortunately, neither of those have English subtitles. So unless you speak Japanese and have the correct region player, they may present a bit of a challenge if you actually want to watch them. If you just want to collect them, by all means, you know, knock yourself out. They'll look cool on the shelf. I understand that totally. Uh, but like I said the last time, if you want to watch, head over to Netflix. That's probably your best bet. Um, so what do you folks think? Write in and let me know, earthdestructiondirective at yahoo.com. We could talk about it here on the show. Did, did you enjoy these anime? Uh, did some of them work for you and others not? Were you just turned off by the whole thing? I'd, I'd really like to hear some, some thoughts on this one because I've seen such wildly different um, opinions on these films online in the, in the fandom. So I, I'm really curious to hear what, what the other listeners think. I personally enjoyed them. And again, I may just be more prone because I, I I tend to like things with monsters and, and Godzilla and, and Ghidorah. So maybe I was just coming at it from the right headspace. And maybe somebody that was expecting something different would be disappointed. So I'd really like to hear anybody's thoughts on this. Earth Destruction Direct at Yahoo.com. We can talk about it here on the show. All right, folks, uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will get into listener feedback and closing out the show right here on Earth Destruction Directive. Kenny, I'm starting a podcast. Recruit me and co-host with Attitude. Ay, 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 ay. Uh, what the heck? I thought we put that teleporter in storage. Uh, Michael? Next time you want me on Kaiju Weekly, tell Jimmy to... Drop the act, Nathan. <laughs> this is not the Monster Island Film Vault. Okay, fine. But what's going on? 
I'm having you join me on The Power Trip, a journey through the Power Rangers franchise. It's a podcast version of the article series I'm writing for Kaiju Ramen Magazine. Oh, interesting. We'll spend a year analyzing the Power Rangers franchise, dedicating an episode to each season and movie. Ah, I see. So we'll be doing an overview and talking about them in broad strokes. Exactly. We'll discuss Ranger teams, the villains, the theme songs, and so much more. Can we give out final words for stuff like the best fight scene and the craziest moments like I do on Henshin Men? You bet. More phenomenal. When do we start? We drop episodes every two weeks starting Tuesday, January 4th, 2022. You know what that means, Michael. It's Morphin Time. All right, we are back here on Earth Destruction Directive, and I hold in my hands a little bit of listener feedback. If you would like to get in touch with the show, you can email me at earthdestructiondirective at yahoo.com. You can also find me on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Just listen to the outro to the show, and all that information will be there. So let's get right into it. Our email this time comes from my brother, Jason Giaconetti, and is entitled The Bermuda Depths. And Jay writes, hey, Luke. Just a few quick notes on the latest episode. One, how do you ever get through an episode with Dr. Bill? The tangents and laughing gets nuts at times. I should know, because Frogs took four hours to get in a 90-minute episode in the can. Yes? Yeah, pretty much. The, uh, you know, I don't know, Jay. It's a, it's a, it's a legitimate question. Um, it's not a bad question, Bert. Um, the, uh, as far as with Dr. Bill and I, all I will say is that we did an episode of Back to the Bins where we then released a second episode that was just as long of us just tangenting and BSing. So uh, you get Bill on the horn, and he is just such a funny guy, and you know you, you can't. It moves, you know, just it's one long unbroken sentence moving from topic to topic type of situation. So, and that that Frogs episode is a good back in the archives. That's a good episode. Uh, that had some funny bits at the end too. Bring in the stunt frog. Uh, <laughs> Jay continues. Two, a big turtle in a movie, but no mention of one million years B.C. Dad and I covered it on Bots, Bugs, and Babes. Yeah, I guess it's context, right? We think more Gamera than, than uh, one million years B.C., but big turtle for sure in that movie. Three, also no mention of shaking hands with danger when they cut the cable with tension on it. I was shocked. Um, I'm trying to remember. There may have been some shake hands with danger talk that got cut. <laughs> to be honest with you. Shake hands with danger... Uh, if you don't know it, folks, look it up. It's it's one of the greatest riff tracks shorts of all time. It is incredibly funny. It is also incredibly difficult for me to watch because I work, I mean, I'm an engineer, so I'm on industrial settings quite a lot. So things like that, I I, I laugh, but I also cringe because I, I know those things. Those are real safety things, so I have a hard time with them. Shake hands with danger. <laughs> Uh, Jay continues, number four, and Kong76 rears its head here too. Jeez, can it just go away? Lol, I wish it would just go away. <sighs> but hey, King uh, King Kong Lives, uh, Blu-ray announced, so we got that going on. Uh, number five, the turtle jumping up to down the helicopter must have inspired the last shark a few years later, just saying the Italian's ripping something off? That doesn't sound right. I don't know about that. That's kind of a, that's crazy talk, man. <laughs> Number six, the Shawn Michaels vs. Undertaker package featuring the cover of Running Up That Hill by Placebo for their match was for their match at WrestleMania 26. Uh, yeah, I, though I knew it was for the rematch. I didn't remember what number it was. Um, yeah, it's classic. I mean, it's one of the greatest, pro, you know, promo packages in, in wrestling history. People say, well, WWE doesn't do anything right. They still do a good promo package. You know, that one, and I think back to, um, what is it? Uh, uh, Steve Austin versus The Rock with uh, I'm a, with My Way by uh, Limp Bizkit, also one of the greatest uh, wrestling promo packages of all time. Great song, too, by the way. I love the Kate Bush version and the placebo version. Uh, Jay continues, number seven, grappling hook that fires. Check out the G.I. Joe Mountain Assault mission gear. Yep, absolutely. That's definitely one of them. I love those little motorized battle packs and mission gear. Cool, cool stuff. We had the, um, I remember I had the drill, which was a Cobra one, the Earth Borer, I think it was called and the mountain climber, and then you had the little helicopter pack. Uh, <laughs> we're going deep, folks. Um, Jacob News, also the Ellie Sadler from Jurassic Park, and M. Bison version one from the G.I. Joe action figure line as well. 
Uh, I will add, I believe, Snake Eyes version 4, which was the, the blue, black, and silver Snake Eyes, had the grappling hook uh, launcher. Uh, never had that Snake Eyes. I had, that was like 91, so that was like the last year that I had G.I. Joe's, um, that I didn't buy as an adult, obviously. Uh, and in retrospect, it's like, man, I wish I had that Snake Eyes, because you had, my brother had Snake Eyes, as I never had a Snake Eyes. I've, I own exactly, I think, two Snake Eyes figures, which is amazing, but neither here nor there. Uh, number eight, for more info on Nessie, check out John LeMay's book, The Big Book of Japanese Giant Monsters, The Lost Films, Mutated Edition. Amen to that. Nessie is a fascinating story of a film that was never made. I don't know what the final product would have been, would have been like, but man, I would have loved to have seen it. Cause that brings together two of my favorite things with Hammer and, uh, and, and, um, Toho on that one. Uh, Jay finishes up a great and funny episode, guys, especially for a movie I have never seen. Thanks. Keep them stomping. Jay, thank you very much for writing in. Yeah, Bermuda Depths was a, was a hoot, a hoot of an episode. It was a, an interesting movie. It was a thought-provoking movie. I'm, I'm glad Dr. Bill suggested that. I'd never seen it either. So uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you very much for writing in. Now, we have another email from my brother. Uh, that's the only other email we have, so I'm going to keep that one in the email sack for the time being. I'm going to put out the call. Uh, I would, uh, folks, any type of email would be really appreciated. You know, uh, if you want to hear your name on a podcast, it's your opportunity to send me an email, Earth Destruction Directive, at yahoo.com. Now, I also, for the last couple of episodes, both the Ultraman episode as well as our guidance with the uh, interviewing Ross Radke, we did get uh, quite a bit of social media love, likes, shares, retweets, uh, thumbs up, all that good stuff. And social media love came from, hey, my brother, Jason Giaconetti, John Vanover, who got a shout out early in the episode, Mr. Lomax, Robert Ludwig, the most sane man among us, Derek, Derek WC, Derek W. Crab, and the Fan Holes podcast. Derek got a shout out earlier too. Tim Elliott, Gene Gene, the podcasting machine, Hendrix, Billy D, aka Doc Strange, Chuck Rodriguez, Nathan Marchand, and the Monster Island Film Vault podcast. Chris Mounts, Chris Warden, Brian Severe. Wacky Bronze and Silver Comics on Twitter. Camo Bat Dad to True Freaks Podcast Network. The aforementioned Ross Radke, creator of Stomped. Robert Rowling. Crystal Lady Jessica. The Two Man Power Trip Podcast. It's really just a Power Trip Podcast, but I call it the Two Man Power Trip Podcast. The Henshin Men Podcast. The Telltale Mind. Spy D. Paul Hicks. Mike at Send Aliens to Me. Into the Weird Podcast. At Marlot. Marlut1, I'm, I'm mispronouncing your handle, I'm sorry. Professor Allen of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network. Colton Ritter, E. Burenson, Dan vs. Dan, Brorad, Batagor Johnson, Calvin Wayne Frey, E-Man 22, at Only a Big Child, Aeris, and at Godzilla Island. Thank you very much for all that social media love. It is much appreciated. Helps get the word out for the show. And uh, please keep it up. You know, I always try if... Uh, a uh, podcast I listen to or that my fr- one of my friends or uh, colleagues is involved with, always try to, to pump it up, give it a signal boost there. So do appreciate that. Uh, I would also like to take a moment to let everyone know, of course, that Earth Destruction Directive is for everyone. If you are interested in giant monsters, whatever portion of that fandom you are interested in, you are welcome to be a part of and interact with this show as much as you feel comfortable. Uh, I try to present this show not as an elitist show or a gatekeeping show, but a show for everybody just to have an outlet to talk about the giant monsters that we're all so fond of. All are welcome. So, we've done our, our social media recap. We've done our feedback. That pretty much leaves us here as we look forward. And what's coming next? There's always got to be something coming next. So next time, we are doing another third part of a trilogy. This one's a little bit more loose, though. And we're finishing this series up. And we've covered the last two films, and it's taking quite a while. But we are taking a look at Ultraman Saga, which I consider the third of the very loose trilogy of the Ultraman Zero feature movies. So taking a look at Ultraman Saga, it's been a number of years since I've seen this one. Last time I saw it was on a Malaysian DVD, so I'm looking forward to watching my uh, uh, my Mill Creek one instead. I believe that was on Mill Creek, now that I say that. I'm almost certain of that. They've released everything else uh, with Zero, so I'm sure it is. So very much looking forward to watch that. Um, it's funny because with the kids, we, we watched obviously Ultraman Z and Ultra Fight Galaxy, and so Zero's in there as like this, you know, big, bad hero, right? But I remember when Zero was the guy that, he was the new guy, right? Watching uh, Mega Monster Battle and, um, you know, um, Revenge of Belial. 
So it's it's very neat to or belly all belial belly all. Uh, it's very neat to see Zero kind of come into his own. And Saga, I remember being being pretty good, a little bit different than those those two previous films. So come on back and check that out. Of course, we'll have any additional news that crops up. It will be, you know, getting the month of Godzilla Day. So who knows what kind of news we're going to get. If we get any more information from Mill Creek about new Ultraman releases, uh, anything about that, that Mill Creek license possibly ending, which, well, not possibly, it's going to end soon enough is what I keep hearing. But who's going to pick it up? I've heard speculation about some different outfits, but nothing official yet. Uh, what does this mean for the ones that haven't been released? All that stuff. Uh, so, uh, and remember, if you hear anything, go ahead and send it in, EarthDestructionDirective at Yahoo.com. Hope everybody enjoyed the show. Hope everybody uh, enjoyed listening to uh, our discussion about Godzilla the Planet Eater. Hope everybody comes back next time for Ultraman Saga. And until then, keep them stomping. This has been Earth Destruction Directive, a Daikaiju podcast, produced and created by me, Luke Giaconetti, as part of the Two True Freaks Internet Radio Network, available at twotruefreaks.com. This is a fan work celebrating the history and culture of Japanese giant monsters. All movies, TV shows, comic books, characters, and other intellectual property is copyright their respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended or implied. If you would like to send an email to the show, you can email me at earthdestructiondirective at yahoo.com. I try to respond to all emails, and if you send in some comments, I will read them on the show. All episodes of Earth Destruction Directive can be found at 2truefreaks.com. You can also find the show on your favorite podcatcher. Just search for Earth Destruction Directive. You can even leave a review on your podcatcher of choice if you'd like. You can find me on Facebook. Just search for first name Luke, last name E-D-D. You can also get in touch with me on Twitter. Just search for the handle at L Giacone. That's L-J-A-C-O-N-E. The theme song for this podcast is Future Gladiator by Kevin MacLeod downloaded from Incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. Thanks for listening, and be sure to come back next time for more city-stomping fun here on Earth Destruction Directive. Tune in next time to hear the crusty old podcaster from Oklahoma say, There's a WTF (laughs) moment if I ever saw one.